Once upon a time, in a faraway land. What are fairy stories? The strange and wondrous place where nothing is as it seems. Magic mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest? Fairy is a perilous land. Before she found herself falling down what seemed to be a very deep it well. It is the place you visit A world in your of dreams. myth and magic. When the clock began to turn, the stars sailed down through the sky. A mysterious voice began calling to the sad princess. She pricked her finger with her needle. Three drops of blood fell on in the In a trance, she followed the haunting sound of a winding tree. stairway to the top of the you tower. You can read along with me in your book. Let's begin now. Well met, witches. Welcome once again to Storybook, Sacred Lore of Witchcraft. Today we're taking a different approach to our sacred reading. We're going to look at the astrological influences that show up in the works of William Shakespeare. And we have with us a guest from the other side of the pond, Kelly Downs. Hi, Kelly. Can you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Hi, Erin. Thank you so much for having me. I would like people to know um, a little bit about how I got into this wonderful world of uh, Shakespeare. So um, I am indeed across the pond over in Birmingham in the United Kingdom. But I grew up actually in upstate New York and then lived for a while uh, in Boston before I came here. Um, and during that time, I've, I've been a theater maker for uh, many years uh, as an actor and a director, a producer. I like to wear many hats. Um, <laughs> but my favorite thing was always uh, the works of Shakespeare, whether that be reading them, performing them, talking about them with people. Um, so back in 2019, I uh, decided to go and pursue my master's degree. So I moved to Stratford-upon-Avon to study Shakespeare and creativity at the Shakespeare Institute through the University of Birmingham. Um, so that's what brought me sort of over here. Uh, the thing that I love most about Shakespeare is um, just how vividly uh, he was able to paint the human experience. Um, I find the language uh, is such a beautiful big container to be filled by the many complex and, I oftentimes messy emotions that we humans have. Um, so that I always found great comfort in. Um, so it's been a real, a real blessing to come over here and um, continue my focus on Shakespeare, continue learning about it. I must say it was a couple years now since, since I did the degree, but um, it still sticks in my mind. So uh, yeah, that's a little bit about, about me and how I got here. That sounds like an amazing experience. Um, you mentioned Shakespeare's use of grand emotion, and it, Professor Harold Bloom actually wrote of Shakespeare and the invention of the human, crediting him with really the creation of the modern persona and individual psychology that we experience now. Yeah. I don't know that I necessarily believe in that, but what do you think about that? Mm, I think... Just to say, I am very wary of ever uh, putting Shakespeare too much on a pedestal. You know, I think, you know, we can get into a danger of, of um, over-egging too much this sort of like genius figure. But I think sort of what, when you bring him down a peg and get to kind of like look at him square in the face, you get to see those intricate details even more uh, vividly. Um, so I'm, I'm sure someone was writing humans very, very well before him. He just stuck, he stuck around the longest, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> right. And I'll just say posthumously, <laughs> his popularity was spread through very forceful, systematic promotion. Yeah, of course. So how did you come to astrology and Shakespeare? Yes. Yeah, so um, as part of my degree, um, I sort of had... My academic uh, classes focused on Shakespeare, but also the creative side as well. So um, my cohort and I were together um, creating new work, new theater inspired by Shakespeare as part of our program. Um, but at the very end of the year, um, our, our big project is that we all had to write a thesis to earn our master's. And um, I, it's an interesting topic. So I 
so to say, I, I wrote my thesis on the dramatic functions of uh, astrology in Shakespeare, and I came I came onto it in um, a sort of odd way. I, I was actually planning to write about something completely different, and um, I went to my <laughs> academic advisor to tell her my plan, which I can't even remember what it was now. So clearly it wasn't a very good idea. Um, but she uh, urged me to look at something else. My original proposal wasn't really going to work for the, the format of a thesis. And her advice to me was to just go home and really think about what I'm interested in. What, what would I be passionate about? What would I find a lot of joy in writing about? Um, because it's going to be a lot of a lot of writing. Um, so I went home and I just sort of like wrote on a bunch of sticky notes, anything I could think of that might be interesting. Um, and I've always been a, a fan of astrology just in general as like my own interest. Um, it makes me feel very close to my grandma. My grandma was very into astrology. And so I think that's sort of where it came from. But that was one of the things that came up when I wrote it down. And I think I had on my mind, you know, the star-crossed lovers of Romeo and Juliet. There's some really vivid astrological language in King Lear. Um, and as soon as I had that down, it was the only thing in my sort of crazy pile of subjects that I was like, I've never really seen anyone write about this. It was something a little bit unique. And I think um, at first I found myself judging the topic a bit. Um, I was thinking, oh, you know, is, is this intellectual enough to write about? Um, and I stopped myself because, you know, just because that's a subject that we now in our modern day have claimed that's a hobby, you know, that's co-star, like an app on your phone. It's, it's not, it doesn't have any intellectual merit. It was actually an incredibly important part of Elizabethan life um, for, and, and life even earlier on. Yeah, it was, it was very important to them. Um, it was directly tied into medicine and decision making. Um, so I think we were doing, I was doing a disservice by judging the topic with my modern brain, rather than thinking about the people at the time who were actually listening to these plays. And that would have been an incredibly important part of their life. So I wanted to kind of put myself in their shoes a little bit and start to look for, you know, what are the resonances that maybe we're missing as a modern audience that Shakespeare's audience would have heard immediately. Um, so that's really why, why I got into it. And yeah, it just kind of flares from there. <laughs> So opposed to our modern cosmology or assumptions about the world, Shakespeare's audiences would have ascribed to a cosmology we could call the Elizabethan chain of being. Would you like to describe that a little bit? Yeah, of course. Um, so there's a couple different branches of astrology. And when, when I say astrology, um, I should say that the distinction that we have between astronomy and astrology is, is a relatively modern one. So they were much more, the lines were a bit more blurred then. Um, and on that topic of just um, language that I'll be using, if I refer to stars, um, back then the sun and the moon were um, often included in that as well. So just for, for clarification as, as I move forward, if, if that comes up. So, um, yeah, there were a couple different ways that astrology was used. Um, there was the natural side of astrology that was looking into how the movements of celestial bodies and planets, uh, how those impacted natural phenomena. So that's weather, agriculture. Um, in, this, in this case, natural also applies to kind of large groups of people, so big shifts in power, big shifts in religion, things like that. Um, and on the other side of things, you have judicial astrology, which is much more concerned with the individual person. So when we talk about astrology today, we might say, oh, you know, what's your sun sign? What's your moon sign? And when we're asking that, we're actually talking about nativities, um, which is a map of the placement of all the stars and planets at the moment that you were born. Um, and that goes back thousands of years, you know, people have been drawing nativities for people and places and events for forever. Um, and so that's something that we've kind of held on to. So you can either have nativities, the moment someone was born, kind of what does that mean for their future? What does that mean for their behavior, their personality? Um, but it also is sometimes used, um, physicians would use nativities. And the way they would do this is sort of an offshoot of nativities. They'd actually chart the placement of planets and stars at the moment a question was asked or at a moment that a patient came in because that would influence how they diagnosed that patient. Um, 
And astrology is also really tied up in humors, which is another big part of medicine at this time. Humors is definitely not my area of expertise, but I'll, I'll do my best to describe it the best I can. But basically, it's the idea that we have these different um, humors in the body, like blood, bile, phlegm, you know, uh, and there are planets that can influence them. Um, so, for example, uh, a planet like Mars would uh, influence your collar. So, Mars, god of war, um, very heated, very brash. Um, that if you were being influenced by Mars might throw some of your, your humors off balance. I can't remember which humor it is that affects that one, but it's all very tied up into uh, Elizabethan medicine at this time. Um, so yeah, that there's a, um, oh, and I'll say another thing. Um, in addition to physicians and diagnoses, um, people in power at this time might use astrology to decide the best time to start um, any sort of enterprise, um, whether that be military or, um, you know, kings and queens giving rulings, astrology and mapping the, the, the where the planets are. If there's a more favorable time to start something according to the cosmos, uh, they might consult that, like their court uh, astrologer might advise on the best time to do something. Um, so it was very ingrained in a lot of different uh, parts of life. And that also wasn't... Um, it wasn't specific to class either. So it wasn't just, you know, very noble and educated people who would have um, a knowledge of astrology. Um, pretty much every walk of life would be introduced to it. Um, and that was actually through the um, distribution of almanacs, um, which are almost like a diary for the year. Your calendar, you've got your notes section, but it also would plot out the entire year. The um, position of planets, uh, moon phases, any notes that might be important. Um, and any, any uh, you know, regular schmo could have an almanac by, by the bed. Um, so it was really, no matter who you were, you probably had some sort of engagement with astrology um, to, to some varying degree. Sorry, that was quite a lot of <laughs> information all at once. That's great. It sounds like we're getting to aspects of a broader concept of the reflection of what's happening in the stars in the layout of society and on the earthly plane yeah absolutely i think um you know it, it was it was a helpful tool for them i think to kind of navigate the world through um you know having that external figure this idea that there, there is something bigger than just us that they can consult that they can look to um and no matter you know what religious um what religion you followed at this time a lot of times astrology could sit very neatly next to it you know um many christians thought well you know god created the planets god created the stars so that's how he communicates with us so it, it really it wasn't in it wasn't in opposition of any of any religious persuasion it, it actually could sit quite neatly alongside a lot of different religions and i think there's something quite nice and, and lovely in that and then as such a common part of society's understanding, how does that start showing up in Shakespeare? Ooh, yes. Um, so Shakespeare, I think, through a lot of his plays, is always concerned with the idea of fate and free will and the choices that we make, um, whether or not you are predisposed to a certain life because of who you are, where you came from, who, you know, and I think this is a question that a lot of people, you know, will continue talking about and thinking about for a long time. Um, so that question and that idea was one of the direct critiques of astrology at the time or, or why it might not sit right with people. The idea that just because you were born under some particular planet you automatically are going to be a thief or you know whatever it is this idea that someone could just do something and say well it was the stars what was i supposed to do you know i think that didn't sit very well with people but it's, it's quite interesting dramatically speaking isn't it like it, it's quite a fascinating thing to work into the world of a play um this idea of someone being set on a path and they have no idea am i choosing this or is this happening to me and i think we see this in a lot of plays. We see it in King Lear. We see it in Julius Caesar. You know, like it is the stars, dear Brutus. Um, this it gets used often uh, to kind of persuade characters and and make them want to kind of defy um, 
the odds, defy fate. Um, so I think we see Shakespeare starting to, we see him starting to directly play out different versions of what this might look like, right? Like we can look at someone who is so against astrology, so against the idea that they might be just at the mercy of something larger than them, that they don't have that free will. We see this in uh, Brutus and Cassius and Julius Caesar, the idea that, you know, there's this godlike being Caesar uh, that's come to power and they say, no, I do not accept this world, this this fate that has been given to me. I'm, I'm going to do something about it. Um, and actually, as they dig their heels in more against their, you know, so-called fate that they think they're being pushed toward, they actually, it, it ends up going worse and worse for them. And by, and by the end of the play, we have Cassius out on the battlefield, realizing he's about to die on his birthday. He has a whole speech about, oh my gosh, to, to his servant, today is my birthday. Like It's this amazing moment where this idea of a nativity, this idea of like this full circle moment that he's been trying to push off forever, um, he's actually found himself right back where he started, you know? Um, and then we have people who are, are a little bit more um, willing to work with the stars, you know? Or like, okay, you know, I, I can accept that I have a fate, but I'm going to do my best to make the best that I have with it. And I would say we see that in All is Well That Ends. Gorgeous, gorgeous play. A lot of celestial language. Our our heroine, Helena, is um, the subject of unrequited love. Um, and and she thinks uh, it's because of their stars. She actually says this. She's born of baser stars. And that's why she and Bertram can't be together. And throughout the play, I mean, All is Well That Ends is kind of the, the joke, right? She's like, it's going to work out. I know it will. I know. I have this sort of like almost cosmic knowledge. She knows where she needs to be, what she needs to do. Um, and she's sort of using the path and, and working with it in a more malleable way. Um, and then we get to Romeo and Juliet, where uh, I think Shakespeare's playing with, what if we were completely oblivious to any sort of greater condition at all? <laughs> and um, we sort of see see how that goes. So I think Shakespeare's really interested in the different versions of the answer to the question, am I in charge of my own fate? And I think he uses his place to kind of explore different um, depictions of what that might look like, depending on um, the behavior and the inclinations of the character. I love the ideas that we're getting at divining the turnings of fate and then attempting to work with those strands of fate are aspects of traditional witchcraft as I understand it. Were there any plays that you had to struggle to find some form of astrological knowledge or references in? Oh, <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. I actually needed to whittle it down. You know, I only had a certain number of words that I was allowed to allowed to write. So, um, yeah, I think you find varying degrees uh, of it. There's certainly, I would say, at least celestial language in many, many plays. I think what I kind of zeroed in on and was looking for were plays where the idea of um, prognostication of sort of um, predictions happening or um, specific planetary movements where it's not just a general relationship between humans and the stars, but actually like a much more nuanced engagement with what that means, what that looks like. Um, I was drawn to All's Well That Ends Well because, I mean, that's not a play that I think it's talked about very often, but I, I have this whole different view on it now because there's this very silly scene actually right in the beginning where Helena and Carolus, um, one of the more comic characters in the play, have this witty banter about how he was um, he was born under Mars. And he's like, yes, of course, I was born under Mars. I'm a soldier. I'm so brave. And then Helena quips and makes a joke like, oh, when he was retrograde because you go backwards in a fight. Um, and it's such like a, a weird, wonderful, interesting moment for me that I was like, 
for a modern audience, you might not even really catch that if, if you were listening. But for, for an Elizabethan audience, those ideas, those concepts were so at the forefront of their mind that it actually meant a lot. Um, so I, I had to, I was a bit strategic about which ones I looked at. Um, so there's certainly more research to be done in this area, I should say, as well. And I encourage anyone who's interested to dive in because it is fascinating. Um, but yeah, for my purposes, I focused on a couple of plays to keep my to keep my research tight. <laughs> oh, right. So not just the celestial references in the text, but how astrology is influencing the characters. For some reason, this idea makes me think about Antony and Cleopatra a lot. Yeah. Oh, that's such a love. I, you know, I, that's not one that I actually explored too much, but there might be. I'm, I mean, I'm sure that at least that sort of idea of, um, gosh, someone being predisposed to having a certain, you know, behavior. I could see that being definitely in that play. Um, the idea of yet yeah, someone being faded towards something. Um, but yeah, that would be a really interesting, interesting play to look through, to scan through and see, okay, when, when do stars or planets or things come up? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that there is references in it. So then that's all's well that ends well. And what others did you end up focusing on? So the focus of my first chapter was Julius Caesar and King Lear. And I did that because you have, um, some really strong sort of anti-astrology <laughs> uh, language in both of these plays, um, specifically from mostly Edmund and Cassius. And um, I noticed that they had a similar, I noticed they had a similar arc in the play. They start from this place of being just so against astrology, really, really rejecting it, um, but then using it to further their agenda. So for Edmund, this looks like him um, sort of playing his father Gloucester, who is very observant of astrology, very observant of eclipses. He's, he's very paranoid at the beginning about kind of the portents he's noticing. And Edmund immediately uses it and starts mimicking his language, his astrological language, to pit him against his brother Edgar. And similarly with Cassius, he notices um, that Caesar has this very sort of celestial energy about him. He often kind of anatomizes himself and places himself in the stars. And he starts using that to kind of gather support against Caesar. So both of them, while they reject astrology, are using it as much as possible to get what they want. And then by the end, if we fast forward, they're sort of, their idea is shaken a bit. Their skepticism gets shaken. Like I said earlier, Cassius ends up on the battlefield realizing it's his birthday and he's probably going to die on his birthday. Um, and the idea that there's this wheel that's been turning the whole time that he's been trying to fight has actually come around anyway. Um, and then similarly, Edmund, when he realizes that his plot is about to explode and, and he's sort of been found out, um, he has a similar moment where he realizes he's about to be killed by his brother. And uh, he says the wheel has come round and it's this idea of the wheel of fortune that everything that goes up must come down at some point. Um, so that's why I focused on those two first. Um, and then I did all swell that ends well for my second chapter, kind of focusing on a more nuanced approach to astrology, the idea of planets being favorable or unfavorable and what that means, what that looks like. Um, and then I ended on Romeo and Juliet, uh, because it probably has the most famous astrological reference in Shakespeare that that we know being, you know, them being the star-crossed lovers. Um, and I focused on that because I wanted to dig into what that meant and how, how maybe what we think that phrase means could be enriched by putting an astrological lens on that play and sort of what are the references that maybe we as a modern audience are missing. Um, and I found quite a lot <laughs> about that one. So those are the ones I focused on. Now, with Romeo and Juliet, were you able to compare Shakespeare's play with his source material? Yes, that was actually what really catapulted my research on this play. It was this amazing moment of, I was right. I knew it. You know, like, oh my gosh, she really, it, this is a purposeful choice. He's really engaging with this on purpose because... 
His source text is, um, there's actually, there's a couple of, of things that we think could be his source text. There's um, an Italian poem from the 1530s, um, which later gets um, adapted into the Palace of Pleasure. Um, and then there's another epic poem from 1567 that we think is most likely his most direct source text called The Tragical History of Romeo and Juliet by Arthur Brooke. Um, and what's so interesting is that he really didn't change much of anything from his source text. You, you could say maybe it might be his greatest work of plagiarism. I don't know. I would, I would hate it, but it might be. It might be. I, you know, all, all art is, is, you know, begged, borrowed, and stolen. But um, so, but there is one very specific thing that he changes. There's a, we can see one really direct intervention that Shakespeare makes, and that's the time of year that it's set in. So while he's lifting almost direct quotes from some of his source material, he makes the, the distinct choice to set it in the height of summer. So in the Italian poem, in Arthur Brooks' poem, those we know were set in winter because when talking about the Capulet feast, it's a Yuletide feast or a Christmas feast. Um, so that is mentioned specifically in the poem. However, Shakespeare decides that we're going to set his Romeo and Juliet in the heat of July, much like we are now. <laughs> um, so we know this because in the very first scene that Juliet appears in, um, Juliet's mother is talking to her about um, getting married and she'd like Juliet to meet Paris and, and all, this, all these lovely things that a, a mother of a 13-year-old daughter is thinking about. And um, the nurse mentions uh, that Juliet's birthday is coming up. She said, uh, at Lammas Eve at night shall she be 14. Um, and she mentions that Lammas is about two weeks away. Um, so as we know, like Lammas uh, or, or Lunasa being a, a first of August celebration, we can kind of do that and figure out, oh, okay, so this play is unraveling at a very specific time being uh, sort of mid late July. Okay. And for anyone in the audience that had an almanac, which was probably most of the audience at that time period, they would know that this is a point in the summer called the dog days. Um, I don't know if you've ever come across the dog days as a, as a phenomena uh, other than the Florence of the Machine. I had never known about it actually until I did this research. Um, it, it was really very interesting. I don't know what our sort of modern perceptions of it are. Yeah, so I um, knew of the dog days of summer, but I grew up in the Midwest USA and it was very Midwesternized. And it was this idea of like when even the dogs are too hot to move. Oh, it's just this time, usually like the end of August to early September, where the summers just become so unbearable and you can't wait for it to end. Oh, wow. That's interesting. I love that, how the, the term like dog kind of morphed over time. Uh, that's so interesting. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I... I Really, Florence and Machine was my only reference point for it before I started the, <laughs> before I started this research. But um, when I looked into what that meant for an Elizabethan audience and what they would have known the dog days as, um, it's actually in reference to a very specific constellation, and not just constellation, but actually a very specific star. Um, so the dog days are the point in which uh, the star Sirius which is the brightest star in the constellation of Canis Major, um, can be visible just before dawn, right above um, right above the dawn horizon. Sirius would be really, really, really bright. And um, Canis Major is uh, the great dog. Um, he's often, the constellation is depicted as this dog with a fiery mouth. It's very, very dramatic. Um, and at the time, in for someone who had an almanac, what, what might be written about the dog days is definitely just what you said. The heat is going to be doubled, um, and that kind of affects not not only our natural world, but our, our sort of humors and human world as well. So maybe you need to worry about drought. You need to worry about crops dying, fires starting on a more practical level. Um, but it also meant that you had to worry about literally heated temperatures. So heated uh, tempers, heated sexual desire. Um, maybe you're not thinking very quickly. 
quick to anger, quick to love, our passion is sort of ignited in this uh, really dangerous way. It was like a very dangerous time. Um, and I think once you kind of lay that foundation um, over uh, Romeo and Juliet, the play really starts to come to life. Um, okay. The very first scene starts with uh, a brawl in the streets, um, and they're actually they're quipping to each other actually about collar, about being choleric, and um, that that humor that would have would have heated you. Um, and throughout the play, I, I think it's every other scene, someone is commenting about how hot it is. And you could think of it as a throwaway thing, but for an audience then, when they have in their mind what time of year it is, and they're constantly being reminded by the characters on stage about how hot it is, they're constantly being reminded of what that cosmic influence of that star series has on people. So all of these brawls, like these these fights that are like flaming up out of nowhere, Romeo and Juliet meeting and without thinking are immediately like performing a sonnet together and falling in love. Like Juliet having this really headstrong attitude and this really sort of liberated sexual moment. It, it all is like symptoms of a, a cosmic time. Um, and so the fact that that was a very specific uh, change that Shakespeare made to his source material tells me that it was really purposeful and that he really was trying to engage directly with it because of all the things to change. Why that? You know, it, it feels very it felt very purposeful to me. Now, did the source include or did any of those sources include this idea specifically of the phrase star crossed? as well oh i'm trying to remember actually i'm sure it did sorry it's been quite a while since since i've looked for sources. so it's not necessarily a concept that he introduced i don't think so i don't want to i don't want to say that and be incorrect um i think there's a very good chance that that star crossed comes up before shakespeare mm -hmm. i'm actually interested i want to it's been it's been years since i've looked at the source text so i need to go back but i think what shakespeare is doing is pinpointing what star that is which i think is unique that's amazing yeah that yeah that's amazing yeah so while we have a con a, a concept of star crossed he says no i'm gonna pick what star they've crossed and it happens to be serious something i noticed in my just quickly reviewing the text is how often juliet is aligned with the sun or compared to the sun yes yes that um bright light that that um and and the sun again would be a star uh to them as well so um she's aligned to the sun um she's also uh you know R romeo has that beautiful moment of of uh imagining her eyes in the sky as stars and and you know stars in her head um and one of the most um I, what I think is a really striking moment of Juliet aligning with the sun um, is actually, other than, you know, she, she is the sun and that <laughs> beautiful moment. But um, when, when she's waiting for Romeo to come and consummate the marriage, um, she has that fabulous speech. Gallop apace, you fiery-footed steeds towards Phoebus's lodging. Um, such, yeah, it's such a um, oh gosh, I'm gonna I'm gonna misquote it, but she 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 brings up the waggish charioteer Phaeton, and this amazing story about um, the you know uh, Phoebus as the sun god who draws his chariot across the sky to to bring in the sun to bring in day, and um, the the tale from Ovid's Metamorphoses where uh, Phoebus's son Phaeton asks his father, the sun god, for, for one wish, please, can I, like, one thing. And, and he says, yes, my son, anything. Uh, and, and Phaeton says, I, I, want, I want to ride your chariot. I want to, to prove to everyone that you're my father. I, I want to, to, to ride the chariot across the sky. And Phoebus is immediately heartbroken. He says, you can't, please, it's too dangerous. It's too, it's too fiery. It's too out of control. You won't be able to do it. Um, and Phaeton does anyway. And this incredibly beautiful but but tragic and quite violent language about him losing control of the horses and the chariot and it ends up raining fire down and uh, burning the earth. 
and um, to the point where Phoebus actually has to strike down his own son out of out of the chariot down to the sky. And she's evoking this myth, this tale with such eagerness, such excitement, such joy, when really what she's describing and what she's evoking is quite quite a tragic myth of someone being too rash and things going wrong and ending up with, with the world engulfed in flame. And so we're sort of seeing two sides of the coin of Juliet as the sun, right? She's this beautiful beacon of light to Romeo. And then on the flip side, there's this sort of, there's this dangerous, this, this rash, this um, overly ignited uh, side of her that um, which ends up, you know, sort of leading to the tragedy of the play. Um, so yeah, that that was really striking to me as well when I when I looked at um, that myth and really when I thought about what it meant and and what she's talking about. Um, and I think it's a nice juxtaposition to all of the really beautiful, loving, tender language about Juliet is the sun, arise, fair sun, you know, yeah. <laughs> that reminds me of Plato's myth of the chariot, which I've brought up in other discussions, but I think he adapted it from this myth. And the charioter, which he s compares to the soul, the human soul, it has to balance two horses, one horse being basically lust or sensuousness, a pleasure in earthly senses, or the other, which is spirit, which is trying to head towards the celestial realms, uh, towards Olympus and break from the cycle of generation. And the charioteer has to balance them both in order to reach the realm of the gods, in this case to reach Zeus's heavenly feast. So interesting. There's something about this text too where Romeo yes. <laughs> starts out in love with Rosaline and he says he'll never be turned away by another woman. No yeah. no other woman's beauty can compare to Rosaline. Yeah. And then like 10 minutes later, he's, he says something like, <laughs> oh, have my what? eyes ever beheld such beauty? Or, you know, or has like my heart ever loved you know? before this moment? Um, but that also reminds me of Plato in the Phaedrus and the Symposium, where he details the idea of base love, love over earthly beauty versus divine oh, love. Wow. And when we meet um, when we meet a soul in divine love, their beauty inspires us. And this idea of falling in love oh, wow. and having that true love with someone yes. you're, where you're not only lusting after them in our earthly union, but it's turning your face to the archetypal form of beauty, which is in the realm of the gods, in the celestial realm. And that's mirrored here with his turn from his love with Rosaline, which is more of a lustful love to his divine love with Juliet. And even with her as the sun, how sometimes um, solar worship is described as worship of the physical sun as an earthly representation of the spiritual sun, which mm. is uh, beyond the spheres. And there's a line where I might, I'm not sure I interpreted it right, but before Romeo reaches Juliet's balcony. He refers to himself as the earth and turning back towards the center, towards his gravity. And oh, that's really interesting. Goes on to say Juliet is the sun. And it seems to be yeah. this uh, familiarity with the Copernican heliocentric uh, cosmology of the universe, as opposed to what we previously discussed gust as the Elizabethan understanding where the earth was in the center of the universe. Oh, I'd have to look back and see, like, kind of plot out exactly when these um, systems started to, to shift and change, because that's a really interesting, that's a really interesting thought. Um, I don't know how common that idea was. I mean, if, if many people were familiar with it or not. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I gotta get I get a little timeline out and <laughs> map it out. Um, something that you just made me think of that I I actually hadn't even thought of before. So this is really exciting. Was um, 
so one of the warnings about the dog days um, and one of the symptoms that people were very worried about was, um, I think, I think it was, what was it that it was Hesiod, I think that says something along the lines of, um, at this time, um, there's a, there's a gender role swap. Um, I want to find the quote really quickly. It was really interesting. Um, women are most wanton, men are feeblest, is what Hesiod says about the dog. <laughs> and that's definitely Romeo, right? Right? Like, okay. <laughs> but I actually think there's something to be said for this in the play, because we see, I mean, on a surface level, we see Juliet find her power. She gets very headstrong. She's defying her father. She has these like amazing moments of sexual awakening, um, which usually women weren't really allowed, let alone allowed to put like put forth in the world. Um, and on the flip side, Romeo has this very changeable attitude. Um, you know, that there's later in the play, there's actually a moment where he just found out that he was banished and he's fallen into a sobbing mess on the floor. And Fire Lawrence says, thy tears are womanish. Yes, um, yes. And there's a line where he actually says Juliet's love has made him effeminate. And so there's this surface level version of that. But what you made me think of was, okay, Juliet is often getting aligned with the sun, which typically is a masculine energy. When we think about the sun in, the in Western astrology, definitely. Yeah. In, in Western astrology, the sun is this more masculine energy to oppose the moon's more feminine energy. And when Romeo's at the balcony and, and wanting to swear his love, he, he's, he starts to say, I swear by the moon. And Juliet says, don't swear by the moon. Um, and I just thought, what, what a neat little little detail that you know that they're both kind of um diverging to what one would think is sort of the opposite of their traditional gender star sun or moon yeah and the fact that that was actually a, a symptom air quote symptom of the dog days as well so that just popped into my head i thought that was kind of neat yeah that's so wild i i want to see juliet <laughs> just roll her eyes and it's like not by the inconsistent moon <laughs> <laughs> yes Absolutely. I love it. I love when Julia is put fed up with Romeo already. <laughs> and this topic reminds me of something else that I wasn't sure if we'd get into or not. But people kind of hate this play. I mean, many people still love it and find it romantic. But a I lot know. of people, this is their least favorite Shakespeare play. Why uh, do you think that is? I, oh, I get like, I get it. You know, it's it's. I, I feel bad for this play because I think it is too often set as the source, like the, one of the, the set Shakespeare texts for English class in ninth or 10th grade. And the person teaching it might not like it. And I think if you don't like something, you shouldn't teach it. Um, you know, I, maybe that's a controversial thing to say. We all have to do things we don't we don't like all the time. But I think I think it's hard to teach, particularly Shakespeare, if you don't enjoy it. Um, and, you know, totally fine if you don't. Um, but I think it often gets oversimplified to me as it's just a, a play about two dumb kids that make bad choices. Right. Um, and that it's this cautionary tale about rash decision making. And I think, well, well, that's not untrue. I think it's more complex than that. And I think I found something a bit more complex in this reading that, that made me love the play even more. I mean, first of all, I have to say before I get into, into the astrology reasons of why I think it's more nuanced, it has everything. It has like, it's a comedy for the first half. It's a tragedy for the second half. You've got sword fights. You've got gorgeous soliloquies. You've got dick jokes. Like it's a great play. It's a, it's a very fun play. Um, that I think is just, you know, at times maybe overdone. But I digress. I'll go back to my, my scholarly reason why I think it's a good play. Um, I, I think when we put this lens on the play and we think about um, where the tragedy is actually lying is us as an audience understanding that there are forces greater than 
these two kids at work and they are just oblivious to what's happening around them. Um, and the idea that they might be sort of at the mercy of this particular part of the, like if they had just met in January or, you know, like the idea that it, it was just something cosmically, the conditions were not right for them. Um, and that they're at the mercy of that a bit. I, I, th I think is, I think it does the play a bit more justice. I think it does the characters a bit more justice um, than just saying that they're dumb kids that make bad choices. Right. Um, I think it's also a, a bit more of an interesting way to look at the play, um, that there is something greater at work uh, that everyone in the audience knows. They were told at the beginning the chorus comes on, they make their prognostication like astrologers of how the play is going to end. We find out in the second scene that it's the height of the dog days. And then we throw these two kids into this terrible situation of dueling families and that are already quite heated with each other in the most heated time of year. Um, and they're sort of a collateral damage to Canis Major, um, that that was what made me sort of fall in love with the play again, that they're not just star-crossed lovers. They're, there's a specific star they've crossed, and they just didn't take a moment to think about the surroundings. Um, but I get it, if people don't like it. <laughs> That's such a beautiful take on it. And this idea that there's so much force in Romeo says it, he says, I am fortune's yes. fool. And it's heartbreaking when he says it. And at the same time, he's saying that because he's human. He lost his temper. He acted out of spite and revenge. And now because of his own actions, he's blaming fortune. But if the truth is that these forces are larger than they can control. Yeah. It's it's true. He's fortune's plaything. I think it's it's not to make an excuse. It's not to say that they were not acting of their own free will, because of course, of course they are. But I think it's just taking into consideration the idea of what if, you know, let's just imagine what if there is some sort of cosmic force that is working against them, that made those choices harder than they maybe would have been. Um, is is sort of an interesting way to look at the play. Now, have you seen, there's this book, uh, So Potent Art, The Magic of Shakespeare by Emily Carding? Oh, I have not, actually. It's recent. I want to say it came out in 2022, maybe. Um, but she makes a point to link Mercutio with Mercury. And there's some ways that she draws that out to make a lot of sense, like how he's welcome with both the Capulets and the Montagues. He's on the invitation list for the Capulets feast, but he's also like best friends with the Montagues. And astrologically, Mercury is variable. He's uh, considered a day star when he's with other day yeah. stars. He's a night star when he's with other night stars, male with the male, feminine with the feminine. And we see a lot of those mm. ideas play out with the character of Mercutio. I love this already. And his death in the play makes it more curious. It makes it makes it harder for me to line up with the idea of the god and planetary Mercury. But then they do get cursed by Mercury, adding to these compelling forces of fate, which is really interesting. There's a number of elements that are coming together to me as we're talking. Spoiler alert, Romeo and Juliet die. But also, Tybalt dies, Mercutio dies, Paris dies. There was a death in the brawl in the first scene of the play. So there are young victims from the two important family lines of the society. And I think two from the royal house of the prince as well. And we have the presence of Lamas, which in my understanding is essentially a grain festival. And we know historically the cross-quarter festivals held more importance in some ways than the solar holidays. I think the easiest way to get where I'm going is, can you imagine looking at this plot, this play, 
through the lens of the film Midsummer, oh. or even Cabin in the Woods, oh my where we have these young people being ritually killed. Yeah. And of course, this isn't at Midsummer. It's Lamas. But there is this sacrificial element to it, where even the performance of the play could be a remnant of a symbolic ceremonial sacrifice. Wow. I haven't been brave enough to watch Midsummer yet, but I... I oh, I'm, okay. Well, I'm no, glad you okay. reacted anyway. <laughs> well, because I'm, it, has such a, it has such a presence in people's minds, even if you haven't seen it, which I haven't, which I've actually been meaning to watch because I'm like, I've mustered my bravery. I'm, I'm ready. Yeah, um, it's pretty gory. But that is... That is this festival aspect and the idea that I believe Lamas or, or Lunasa, if you're taking the Christian Christianity of it, um, is sort of the, it's like the first harvest festival. So you're almost preparing for the next season, um, you know, moving into autumn, which, uh, you know, of course, is all about um, the, the end of a life cycle and, and preparing for that death or sleep of the earth in winter you know you're moving towards this an ending or or at least you're moving towards a period of time where we start to think about endings we start to think about um cycles completing and and things like that um i i would love to know more about what like a lunasa or a lamas festival was like you know it, it's, it's yeah it's so interesting and because of their sacrifice, their death does bring about change. We had what was essentially like an ongoing war between yeah. the houses is now going to be settled. There will be a time of peace, likely fertility, prosperity, and mm. their likenesses are raised in statues of gold. They erect statues of gold. So now they've become purified. They're perfected. Yeah. And we actually we get um, one more uh, call back to the tale of Phaeton actually in that ending speech because um, the the prince in in his very last line says um, a glooming piece uh, the oh, I'm gonna quote it wrong uh, a, a glooming a glooming piece this morning brings um, the sun for sorrow will not show his head and actually in in the tale of Phaeton um, it ends with Phoebus actually refusing to pull his chariot because he's grieving so much refusing to bring the sun into the sky uh and and all of the you know every all of his fellow gods and goddesses and, and everyone begging him please you have to, this is affecting all of us you have to bring the sun so there's this mirroring again of a parent grieving with the image of the sun not coming out um, which I thought w was a nice callback to that moment with for Juliet as well. That's right. And I remember imagining this as I was reading it in a cinematic style where that the sun won't show its head and and I'm imagining how it would be portrayed in the cemetery all gloomy yeah. and beginning to rain as as everyone is mourning. Mm. And this also reminded me of something I noticed this time is in the film's it's always very sanitized. Um, she's buried in a, in a large mausoleum. Yeah, yeah. But there's many times where characters say that she's entombed or going to be entombed in this decrepit tomb with the recently dead corpse of her cousin Tybalt and all the ancient skeletal remains of her ancestors. And it keeps returning to this idea. I think uh, Friar Lor Lawrence eventually says, ah, the living soul is entrapped in a dead man's tomb yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And he, he wants to get her out of there as quickly as possible because, I mean, similarly, as if you imagine the conditions, if we really lean into what the like disgusting heat of summer, what that would have felt like in all these scenes. Like, yes, my God. Also, if you, if you really think about the conditions of her being in a tomb with a fresh a fresh corpse you know uh, and and all lots of other bodies at various stages of decay like it is it's it's haunting it's terrifying and she's a she's a young girl she's 13 um and just the idea of of what a uh, for such what we think of as a very beautiful play, there's really some some quite violent and quite um, horrifying elements to it as well. And I think that that balance is something worth acknowledging for sure. So it 
turns more horrific as the play progresses, ultimately until that gloomy funeral at the death scene. Are there any ideas that we haven't talked about that you were hoping to discuss today? Gosh, I feel like we could we could talk about this for for hours. I think, Erin, <laughs> I really, um, I, I'll say that um, I focus most mostly in our conversation about Romeo and Juliet, just because I think, as you said, it is a it is a play that a lot of people don't enjoy, and so I uh, hopefully brought a new and interesting um, lens to the play that might. Uh, be fun for people to to revisit it with. Um, However, if you are interested as well in um, astrology in Shakespeare, uh, looking at King Lear is is definitely um, is definitely very rich with astrological texts. And there's also a couple of different versions of King Lear, depending on if you're looking at the folio or the quarto. I won't go into all the boring details of publication, but um, there's a couple different versions of the play. Look at both of them. Um, There is one of the most amazing speeches that Edmund gives at the very top of the play, basically rinsing astrology, like tearing his dad apart. And and the language of it is is just fantastic. It's it's really, I think it really beautifully um, poses a, a, a critique of astrology they had in their day and we still get today it's it's very modern almost in its its critique um and it's it's really just it's a fascinating it's a fascinating read um and and one worth looking at if if astrology and shakespeare is is uh interesting to you highly recommend spending some time with king lear um, for anyone interested there is going to be a future discussion with uh, a friend of mine from instagram rose aurora uh, and she's an astrologer and and seer and 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 spiritual worker, um, and also a fan of Tolkien. And she had a series of posts where she was linking characters from Tolkien's Legendarium with stars. And I thought you might be interested in that. It's not it's not um, astrological influences that he wrote, but connections based on her knowledge of both. It's yeah, really fascinating. Definitely. That sounds fabulous. I'll definitely look her up. Perfect. And for anyone who wants to keep track of what you're working on, or maybe toss out some other ideas about these influences, astrology in Shakespeare, where should they look for you? Um, you can follow me on Instagram, if you like, at kelly.m.downs. Uh, that's my main platform you'll find me on. Well, I'm looking forward to hopefully sharing this your work with uh, some new people Thank you for dealing with time differences and audio issues early on and all of that. I've loved our conversation. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. And let's keep in touch. Thank you for having me. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, look forward to talking with you more about it. (laughs) And for everyone else who's listening, find Kelly Downs and stay tuned to her work. And until we next meet again, may all your travels be filled with wonder.